Shall we begin? Okay. I've just sent around two of the more recent books for you to have a browse through. Um, the Harari book is rather heavy, <laughs> uh, but well worth having a look at. It's only out about six weeks. And the most important thing about the best book is the actual description of the new technology that's emerging, which is at one and the same time very scary, but at one and the same time very promising, depending on your point of view. Um, had a little chat with um, Siddharth about your, um, what would you call it, your, your assessment here. And we came up with something really simple. Uh, so as not to frighten you, but to give you space for yourself. And the second option before I go to the first is you propose your own paper. Come to me. For example, you may have a burning issue with biopharmacy and personhood because maybe you have a background in biopharmacy, I don't know. Or you just want to explore the application of personhood theory to people with intellectual disabilities, I don't know. Whatever you want, but come to me and tell me first about what you want to proceed and do. Not so that I can control or censor, but that I can point you in the direction of what resources are out there. The first one is very generic. It really just requires you to come forward with your own perspective Right or wrong? There is no right or wrong here, as you've probably guessed so far. There's only good arguments and bad arguments. And even then, it's from the perspective of the beholder. Um, do you think there are essential criteria for personhood? That's a big debate, human essentialism. Uh, if so, what are they? And if you name it, and you nail it, somebody's going to get left out. So how do you defend the quote-unquote under-inclusiveness of the criteria that you select. Um, I think somebody the last day said consciousness is the criteria, and the immediate question was, well, what about people who don't have it, OK? <clears throat> um, and then you can treat this as the center of gravity of your paper, or you can just leave it right to the end. And give one view, just a view, about the application of these criteria to the quote-unquote new life forms that are appearing on the horizon through human enhancement and to a certain extent artificial intelligence and machines. Now, I didn't put that in the list of nine classes, but I do have resources on it. So if you are thinking about doing a paper on quote-unquote the legal status of these artificial intelligence-driven machines, do come to me and I'll point you to these resources. And of course, one of the tantalizing questions is that we've all been assuming that personhood is the, the elixir, the highest value possible. Maybe there's a higher one. Maybe there's a higher term beyond personhood that we will be looking at in not, not too distant future. So I lay a prediction. Some of you will be parliamentarians. Some of you will be judges. Some of you will be litigants before the Supreme Court. You're going to face these issues sooner or later. And you have to have some sort of vantage point over which to just grab the issues, frame the issues, and drive them forward. So, hey, there's a bit of money in this. There's some practice for you in the future. Um, what do I want to get at? Let me just review where we were the last day. Try and make it as accessible and as simple as possible. First, we have the empirical question of who counts as a human being which turns out to be a little bit more complex than you think. It's not as straightforward as you think. And the empirical question of who is a human is separate from the normative question about who counts as a person. Obviously, there's an overlap. Obviously, your sense of who a human person is from an empirical, biological point of view informs your approach to the normative question of who counts as a person. Now, if any of you studied ethics, you know that they have a language of their own, they have a worldview of their own, and sometimes it's um, frustrating to actually try and extract from it something that is practicable and usable, particularly for lawyers. But it's worth the excursion and the pain, uh, at least from time to time. Um, and in ethics, we call this the quest for moral considerability, or the question about the moral status of the person. Why? Because if you're part of the moral community, then and only then do we owe something to you. Does the 
um, predicates of justice, whatever they are, actually apply to you. So you can see a whole series of steps here, whereby the individual entity, let's call it that for the moment, gradually proves he or she is human, gradually proves that he or she qualifies for full moral status as a person, and then gets recognized as a person before the law. The key term here is equal recognition before the law. Okay? And only persons can have equal recognition before the law. Interesting the way it's put. It's not unequal depending on how high a status you have or how low a status you have. Once you get past the threshold, it's black or white, all or nothing, you're entitled to all of the freedoms and liberties accorded. So this is a legal question, and of course, you're also entitled to equal protection of the law, which is not to be mixed up with equal recognition of the law. So equal recognition is the threshold question, right? And that's what we're looking at. And don't just assume that because we have a human, we also have a person that's recognized in law. The law, of course, is informed by bi biology, and it's informed by ethics. Um, but I sense personally that it has reasons of its own, that it super adds to these reasons, its other reasons for why certain persons are to be considered um, legal persons before the law and not, and we'll get to that later. Um, so, so that's kind of the setup. That's the kind of phenomenological pattern you follow in order to try and nail down, hopefully, <laughs> the legal status of a person and so forth. Uh, we also saw that when it comes to the biological question, it's actually, you have a lot of choice here. Um, you don't have to fix on cognitive ability as being the essence of what it is to be a human being. Um, in fact, a lot of ethicists these days focus on this, the, the exteriority, how the person presents in the world, how the person connects in the world, the intersubjectivity of the human existence, as distinct from the highly atomistic um, concept of human existence. So, your choice, pick and mix. Um, and we've called out several characteristics there. There's probably more that you could actually fix on. But the very last one, or maybe a third category of its own, is simple sentience. Now, I knew you were going to ask me, what the hell is sentience, right? Um, so I looked it up. I'm ashamed to say in Wikipedia, and here's the definition of sentience. Um, it's the capacity to feel, perceive, or experience subjectivity. What the hell is that? How can we tell that you're actually experiencing subjectivity? What the hell is subjectivity? Okay? All of these definitions beg a whole series of questions that you're going to have to answer sooner or later. 18th century philosophers use the concept to distinguish ability to reason, which is a human being or a person in the Enlightenment, um, from the ability to feel, to feel pleasure or pain, or to react to pleasure or pain, and so forth. Um, it's the ability to experience sensations. And Eastern philosophy, it's a metaphysical quality of all things that requires respect and care. So fascinating divisions between Western culture and Eastern culture right from the get-go. Um, so it's not as if any of these things are objective or fixed out there. There are lots of interweaving cultural determinants uh, and so forth. <clears throat> so I just thought you'd like a definition of sentience. I mean, an omega has sentience. It probably can react against uh, sensations, but is it a person? An entirely different question. So we also saw that from the normative point of view, not from the biological or empirical point of view, uh, over the last three centuries, originally in the West, but spread throughout the world, um, we probably have a singular approach that could be narrowed down into um, being morally considerable as a person, which is no small deal when it comes to those who deviate from the standard of full moral status, right? Um, that you have a minimal level, well actually it's described in the Stanford Encyclopedia, sophisticated level of cognitive capacity. Why? There's no logic at all behind that. 
probably, and this is me just speaking as me, probably it has something to do with the way in which the economy, the society, the culture was shifting at that point in time. And so it's not just about Siddharth, who are you? It's more about Siddharth, do you fit? Do you belong into this new kind of culture that we're creating? So the filter is very much, not so much dependent on your peculiar characteristics viewed objectively. It depends on, are you the kind of guy we want in our new commercially orientated societies whereby what you guys are really interested in is whether his word is his bond, whether you can rely on him, whether he has a stable identity, whether you can negotiate fairly and rationally and objectively with you. That's probably the tail that's wagging the dog in a lot of this, um, but that's just speculation on my part. Um, and lastly, and very importantly, that you possess, you are known and you are knowable to the world. Okay, So sometimes we think a particular individual um, just exists as a body. Let's say somebody with a quote-unquote persistent vegetative state. And that his or her self doesn't exist. All you get is the mirage of the body, right? And that's because we lack the material means to retrieve his or her self. We just, reliance on formal communication won't do it. Um, so, some people work backwards. They say, we can't communicate with him, therefore he doesn't exist. And if he doesn't exist as a person, if he's not morally considerable as a person, or he doesn't exist legally as a person, then things can be done to him. He becomes almost the functional equivalent of property or an object. Not quite, because of course our cultures have intervened the institution of guardianship whereby you take care of Siddharth and you take care of his interests, although that has created lots of problems all of its own. So this is the standard account in law. And it's amazing if you go around the world and you look at legislative definitions of, let's say, legal capacity, your ability to make it in the world as a person. They're all building on this. Um, I think I have the English legislation next. Oh, no, I don't. Let me just flash to it. Just give me a second and I'll get it for you. I did, but where is it? <laughs> I lack capacity. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> Inability to make decisions mean unable to understand the information, to retain the information, to use or weigh that information, or to communicate a decision. Right? So it's all about rationality. It's all about cognitive ability. And this is the doorway to exercising rights. And if you can't prove this stuff, door shuts. You're not considered in law to be a person. So, so this isn't academic stuff. This is stuff that has real consequences for real people. Well, of course, that's begging the question of whether we're dealing with real people. Um, OK, let me go back. So the debate in ethics, leave aside law now for the moment. Um, law considers itself to be hermetically sealed from all of these contaminating disciplines. Uh, but to a certain extent, law picks up on the cues that are put forward by these other disciplines. Um, I don't personally think there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the field of ethics and the field of law. There's a lot of mediating dialogues in between. And so it's not as if law is just reflexively operationalizing ethics. Um, but the fact that our ethical domain has been stuck in the mud for the last 300 years on this fixation on cognition is difficult in law. It's difficult for law to actually innovate and move beyond that, okay? So basically what the ethicists are interested in is are persons morally considerable? Do they have full moral status? And to put it very bluntly, are they really members of the political community or not? And if they're somewhat lesser members of the political community, what's our obligations towards them? Question mark, do we have any obligations toward them? Okay? Um, and the philosophers 
who people love to hate is Jeff McMahon. Jeff McMahon comes close to arguing that people who fall short of the standards set in ethics are objects. And he doesn't quite say it, but killing the object incurs no legal liability. Okay? Um, so I guess the range of entities flows from humans, biological humans, that is to say, impaired humans, humans who lack the sophisticated mo uh, cognitive capacity that the ethicists predicate, children, big issue with respect to children, cultural objects, I thought I'd throw that in there because some cultures actually call cultural objects persons, animals, obviously, the environment. Some people are actually toying with the idea of extending, distending concepts of legal person to apply it to the environment. So when you do damage to the local river, which damages the water supply, blah, 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 you're actually violating not just the people who depend on it, but the actual entity itself. Um, very, very interesting debates on that. There's a lady in Cardiff University in Wales, one of the friendliest countries you'll ever go to, so friendly, so nice, who specializes in applying theories of personhood to the environment. She's an environmental lawyer. Um, and then lastly, of course, inanimate objects. Um, this table can't feel sensations as far as I know. <laughs> uh, but if it did, possibly it's in there with a shot, okay? And most of the ethicists cling to this. These entities either have full moral status or not. And if not, then they're not to be considered objects of justice are subjects in their own right. Some of the philosophers say there are gradations of moral status. If you deviate somewhat from the norm that we are arbitrarily setting, right, um, then it's not, all is not lost. You may have some lesser rights and we have some lesser obligations towards you. And then of course there's the other entities right down at the end <coughs> toward whom uh, we have no obligations and for whom they have no moral status whatsoever. So that's the game, to reduce it simply. That's what's at stake here, and that's how they're playing the game. Um, <coughs> yeah. Idols. Okay. Okay. Oh, fascinating. <laughs> Interesting. I never knew that. I have to for Yeah. Fascinating. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> but does the statue have cognition? No. <laughs> so it's a good example, therefore, of the application of person without cognition. You know, the code. Okay. Okay, okay. So the idol has its own community of interpretation. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm going to work that into some papers. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, just move on a little bit because I have a class exercise. Um, <coughs> You've seen in the entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia, and I apologize, it was a bit dense, but I thought it was worthwhile working through, that in terms of what we owe you if you pass through this threshold as a moral community is, first of all, a presumption against interference. It's like as if an island of immunity is thrown around you, a shield, a shell, into which no people can intrude, which doesn't ipso facto preclude some form of paternalistic intrusion, 
And there's very, very interesting debate in ethics about, and I, this is just my way of putting it, good guy paternalism and bad guy paternalism, right? I won't belabor the point anymore. I think you get it. Um, secondly, very, very interestingly, some notion of an obligation to assist. We are each other's keepers at some level. If we see people in distress, we have some moral impulse, maybe not an obligation, to come to their assistance. And this is something that's really, really interesting when you port it over into the disability context later on. Maybe Amita will talk to you about that. <clears throat> and then lastly, there's a strong reason to treat you fairly or more, more or less equally. I mean, the, what I always say to students about the concept of the dual concept of equality is that it's all about relativities. It's not about substance. It's simply about how you're treated relative to somebody else. <clears throat> and it takes cognition, cognition of material differences. But it doesn't drive the way the judge or the legislature sees those material differences. So, for example, if you wanted to fall back into the traditional ethical way of looking at the world, the material difference of a lack of cognitive ability is highly significant. Therefore, a different legal regime should apply to you. And far from that being discrimination, it's actually driven by your concept of equality itself. Um, maybe that's a bit too high for Luton, and maybe we'll come back to it, but I just wanted to lay it on the line. So, <clears throat> um, this is one of the interesting things in the conventional um, ethical debate, that your moral status is your moral status. It's determined wholly in isolation from others, either the organic group to which you're attached, like your family, uh, or neighbors, or friends, law students in your community and so forth. Um, but I'm not so sure about that. I think relationships and community, particularly dense communities, where I am reflected in you, you're reflected in me, we hold each other and we support each other and our identity is shared, to a certain extent at least. I mean, it's also perfectly individualized, but it is shared to a certain extent. So I'm not completely convinced by that argument that the ascription or the withholding of moral status has nothing to do with the relationships we have. Probably it does. Um, also, they've emphasized, I'm not going to belabor this point, that your moral status is determined in isolation from the wrongs that can happen to you. Just because we acknowledge something is a wrong does not necessarily mean that you full moral status. That's all they're getting at in the literature. So I guess the big takeaway is this relationship dimension. Whether it enters into the picture at all, and if so, how? And if we're in doubt, does it push someone over the line? So take, for example, somebody with a very severe cognitive impairment. According to the traditional approach, there's no doubt. He or she falls beneath the line. They are not a legal person. They are not morally considerable. But if you factor into the equation, um, relationships with parents and siblings and children, uh, high quality relationships in which there is a residue, a spark of his or her soul, if you want to put it that way, or her spirit or her sense of self, then maybe, maybe that's enough to actually push them over the line. I told you about the baby in England that I came across a few years ago who had no front brain. Um, so, this is Albert Einstein. This is the guy with full moral capacity because he's so cognitively advanced. Maybe he should have been a super person <laughs> rather than just a regular person. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if any of you have read um, I I Isaacson's biography on Einstein. I highly recommend it. It's, um, you read it in three nights because you can't put it down. Uh, very, very interesting in how he innovated through thought pictures and how he imagined himself in different places. And that's basically the driving force of a lot of his innovative ideas. Walter Isaacson, he's the president of the Aspen. Um, yeah, that's right, yeah. <clears throat> and the Wright brothers, <laughs> more recently. 
Um, so anyhow, here's the dude. Here's Immanuel Kant, who's responsible for so many of our um, wrong turns, possibly. Um, <clears throat> he really fixates on privileging beings who are capable of identifying their own ends um, and then imagining them and then prosecuting them and so on and so forth. You might say, why should we privilege that? Uh, why should we privilege um, self-seeking individuals as almost masterless men in a new civil society that's been built in the 17th century? Um, but people don't question that. People just accept that if the being can identify its own ends and prosecute them, then it is morally worthy. And if a being can't do that, then it is not morally worthy. Simple as that, okay? Um, <clears throat> anybody who can conceptualize their ends through practical reason is entitled to this elevated status of moral status, okay? Um, others are really, other theorists are variations on this theme. And they tend to factor in and perhaps soften a bit the emphasis by Kant on having the cognitive capacity to imagine your own ends, like self-awareness, you're future-oriented. Sharks are future-oriented. They know where the, the blood is, right? A capacity to value. Somebody mentioned that yesterday. I'm not sure if I picked it up right. Somebody was talking about moral value. Is this what you meant, or was it something else? Okay, your capacity to ground moral judgments and hopefully act accordingly, because <laughs> a lot of us make moral judgments but don't act. Capacity to bargain, this really gets back to relationships and your utility in a community and in a political economy, right? Capacity to assume duties, in other words, you can rely on Siddharth to actually deliver if he says he's going to do something for you tomorrow. And interestingly, capacity to care. Now, lots of these are shared by animals. Elephants definitely care for the young. Even sharks care for their young. Um, well, I've never tested that one out. <laughs> I don't want to test it out. Okay? So, okay. Um, so, full moral status, then, if you adopt the Kantian approach, the black or white, all or nothing, lots of problems immediately arise. Like, for example, infants. Um, I'd like to think my infant has full cognitive capacity, but uh, no, <laughs> it's not true. Um, and some people have suggested a way around this, a way to elevate them up into the status of full moral status, is to say, well, at least they have the potentiality. Um, they have a tomorrow that they can imagine that's like ours. We can connect with them on that basis, uh, and another factor that enters in the equation is that we know we said relationships don't count, but actually a parent-child relationship is incredibly important. Um, of course, that only goes to say why the parent should treat the child as having moral, full moral legal status. It's not to say that third parties should treat the child uh, accordingly and so forth. Um, we have problems with persons with mental illness, but that problem is solvable, right? Because the mental illness is periodic, it's interspersed. Um, the mental illness basically functions as a blockage. We don't know who the real you is, or at least that's what psychiatrists tell us. I'm not so sure <laughs> it's true. Um, that there may be multiple yous hiding behind the mask of the mental illness, and the mental illness may be distorting your inner voice, driving you to prefer some things over other things, that's not actually the real you. And when you strip it away, that, that is the reason that justifies the existence of the field of psychiatry, right? Um, this temporary loss of self, or this temporary disappearance of self, or I put it more accurately, the inaccessibility of self to the normal methods of communication that we use in everyday life. So, um, so that's solvable in the sense that um, this is only a temporary thing. It can be cured for, managed, stroke, cured, although I'm not so sure of that myself. The really difficult one 
is people with intellectual disabilities. So if by definition you're setting up an intellectual standard as the litmus test, anybody who fails that standard by definition is not going to attract full moral status, much less full legal status. That's the one that's vexed the philosophers, especially over the last 10 or 15 years. There's been a spate of arguments going back and forward on this, which is absolutely fascinating to watch and to read. Um, sorry, that's just the, I spoke about that. Let me, so, if, this is the nightmare scenario, if you think people with intellectual disabilities are objects, property, and not persons, not even persons with a lesser moral status, you can do what you like. And this, of course, is what exactly the Nazis did. Um, the first extermination regimes were against people with intellectual disabilities, <clears throat> not against the Jews. They learned a lot from their quote-unquote extermination techniques. Um, reputedly, the request for the extermination program came from parents to the Nazi leadership. Hitler signed off on this and erected what was known as the T4 program. Uh, we're probably going to hold a conference on the T4 program next year. And basically they set up a series of camps throughout Germany and particularly in Austria. I'm not sure why in Austria. Um, we engaged in this from the late 30s probably into the midpoint of the Second World War. Um, they discontinued for a variety of reasons. The reason it's called T4 is that the headquarters was in Tiergartenstrasse off the Brandenburg in Germany, number four. So the program was simply called T4 after the headquarters of the program. That's horrific, but a logical entailment of clinging to the view that people with intellectual disabilities, since they can never satisfy the litmus test, are simple objects to whom you can do whatever the hell you like. Uh, reputedly, it was ended because the churches intervened. But at that stage, the Nazis were no longer interested. What they were interested in is the application of these techniques to the Jews and to others in Eastern Europe and so forth. Uh, you'll find very interesting programs on the T4 program on YouTube. And you'll even find a dramatization of it um, in England, which is also on YouTube. So, <clears throat> um, I just thought I'd highlight this because it was in the entry in the encyclopedia, the Stanford Encyclopedia. Um, and it has to do, flashing forward now, to superhumans, to posthumans, to transhumans, and even to machines and artificial intelligence. <clears throat> one such feature, meaning one such argument for um, not being held to be moral, to have moral status, is the fact that you're designed by somebody else. Right? Uh, they say, not being designed by anyone to fulfill any purpose, which some philosophers hold as a ground for being treated as an end and not as a mere means. You, s you always see the Kantian language creeping back in to the analysis. Um, naturalness that has been unaltered by humans has also been proposed as a ground of intrinsic value. What it really means is that, you know, one of the things about transhumanism is redesign the people of the future. And then nature takes over, and in succeeding evolutions of the generations of the families, the progression is exponential. The growth of cognitive capacity is ex exponential and so forth. But I just thought I'd bring this up, just in case later on you want to work it back into how you treat superhumans and transhumans and so forth. By definition, they're not natural. They are designed. By definition, we are intentionally interfering in the messiness of the normal progress of evolution. Um, by definition, we're playing God. And that explains the title of the book, uh, Homo Deus, the Man-God, that Yuval Harari has actually has written. So, um, just to bring home to you how deeply embedded the Kantian ethic a full moral status based on cognitive capacity is. Can anyone tell me where this is from? 
say, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And they are endowed with reason and conscience. It's taking sides there in the debate about biology and in the, the debate about the normative status of humans as persons seems to be hinting that because humans have cognition and because humans have conscience, that's why they're actually the beneficiaries of these human rights. Um, I thought it was interesting to point out, and also, where's the arrows? <clears throat> um, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, sorry. I just want to highlight one other thing. Where is it? There's, this book came out about four or five years ago. There's a fascinating article in it by a lady called Anna Greer in Cardiff University. Um, it's called The Cambridge Companion to Human Rights. And this is her article, Framing the Project of Human Rights Law Reflections on the Dysfunctional Family of the Universal Declaration. What she does is she goes through all of the different human rights treaties and she extracts from them images of the person in those treaties and finds they're highly discordant. They're, they don't overlap. They don't reinforce each other. They're very, very different. I think that's actually fascinating for a lawyer to come to terms with. Um, very seminal work. Uh, and this is the actual chapter. Uh, I did the next chapter. <laughs> we will talk about that later on. Um, let me go back. Sorry, things are not in, OK, in sequence here. This lady, wow, you could write a PhD just on this lady. Her name is Eva Feder Kite, uh, which is Hungarian in origin, I think, but she's American. Um, she's classically trained ethicist, wonderful person, and she takes Jeff McMahon, she takes on um, Peter Singer, she takes on the traditionalists who cling to the view that if you don't have full cognitive capacity, you don't count as a person, right? And she happens to have a daughter who has an intellectual disability. Uh, this article is one of the most read, quoted, cited articles in the field, and it's called, fittingly enough, at the margins of moral personhood. And she puts together a series of arguments against the dominant view that cognition is actually the essence of what it means to be a person. Um, very, very, very eloquently. She edited a book six, seven years ago. I'll have to find the reference for you. Um, it's called The Challenge of Intellectual Disability to Morality and Ethics. Very, very, very good book. Um, excellent contributions. Um, what she says, I shall argue against the view that such intrinsic psychological capacities as rationality and autonomy are requisites for claims of justice, a good quality of life, and the moral consideration of personhood. That is that these capacities are the principal qualification for membership of a moral community of individuals deserving equal respect and dignity. I recognize I swim against the tide, but to argue otherwise is to exclude those with severe cognitive disabilities from the moral consideration of persons, and I believe this exclusion to be as morally repugnant as earlier exclusions based on sex, race, physical ability have been, so forth. Very, very fascinating essay and it's part of a long line of papers she's written and two or three books as well that I just wanted to make you aware of. So within ethicists there is this debate going on. Um, I'll move on because I want. Also interestingly we were just briefly chatting about this beforehand. Um, the surprising sources of alternative views of personhood and the meaning of personhood out there um, I'm not in the least bit religious, but it's quite fascinating. There's some interesting journals on the intersection between here it's religion and disability, but in other cases it's religion and law, which provide alternative views for valuing human beings. Right? Obviously, it's going to be based pretty much on the relationship 
between the human being and his or her creator or God or gods or what not. Okay? I just thought I'd point it out to you. Uh, I think every article is freely available online. You don't have to go through a proprietary database to get all of these articles. Some really fascinating work in there. Um, okay, so I mentioned this to you. Um, Martin Nussbaum, um, whom some of you may have come across, uh, wrote a book on the challenge of disability to ethics, to morality, and was based on one of the lectures she gave in the Tanner series. I don't know if you know the Tanner series. If you just Google the Tanner series of lectures, wow, what a treasure trove you'll find, not just in this area, but in so many other areas. So this book, which came out maybe five years ago, um, Frontiers of Justice, Disability, Species Membership, and so forth, very, very fascinating. She since tries to rehabilitate contractarian theories of justice and tries to fit those who fall short of the high standard into the contractarian theory of justice. That's code word for the issue scandal, whatever you want to call it, embedded in the work of John Rawls, who was quite explicit, although subsequently tried to explain it away, in saying that people with intellectual disabilities cannot form part of the original position to negotiate the social contract, fictional though it is. Um, so he struggled to um, name them as beneficiaries of the theory of justice that he actually provided. So the debate has been ongoing about his legacy. In other words, how expansive can you interpret contractarian theory to actually embrace issues like intellectual disability, or do you go back to a very strict understanding of John Rawls? So Nussbaum is a very interesting example of someone really grounded in social contract theory, trying hard to create a space for what you might call people of lesser moral status who probably deserve full moral status. Um, this is what I want to do. Um, I've been talking, you've been reading, now I want you to argue. Um, I want to divide you into two sections. I want to give you 10 minutes to prepare. And I'm going to call the good guys, these guys over here, good guys. That's actually taking sides, isn't it already? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I want you to argue that persons with intellectual disabilities enjoy full moral status. I don't care what the arguments are. Uh -huh. They can be traditional arguments or arguments you make up yourself. And how about two ladies here? You join these, and you, you're with the bad guys. <laughs> the bad guys who say, no, 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 no. We have hierarchies of persons in, our, in biology, in our normative understanding of what a person is, and in law. You certainly have it in law. But the debate today is whether we should eliminate it in law, but you certainly have it in law. So, mingle, have a chat amongst yourselves. I want to see the arguments in, oh, okay, maybe 12 or 14 minutes, not 10 minutes. So, take over. You can appoint a lead counsel. You can determine how much he or she gets paid. You can bribe the judge. <laughs> No. Do you want to stop the camera for 10 minutes while they're doing this?